Hello. Uh, hi there. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Ali, and I'll be interviewing you for engineering science today. Uh, hi, Ali. Uh, I'm Adam. Uh, nice to meet you too. Nice to meet you, Adam. Um, so we're going to be starting with some maths questions, and we'll build up on that and do some mechanics and thermodynamics questions. Um, so I want to start with um, estimating seven to the power of six. Seven to the power of six. Um, okay. Well, so, okay, so seven to the power of six. Well, so out of seven and six, to me, seven seems like a harder number to work with. Maybe so. I can write seven as six plus one to the six, and then I can expand this and maybe just think about the biggest terms. So that would be six to the six plus oh, six. Well, actually, um, uh, expanding six would be, I mean, not expanding, but um, writing six in a different way would probably be an easier way of doing this. Sorry, you mean which six, the, what, the six in, in the expansion here or the original six? No, the original six. Uh, okay. I'll rub that out then. Okay, so, well, six is just about well, six times one, obviously, but then also two times three. Yeah. So, I could either write seven cubed squared or seven squared cubed. And well, just, I, well, seven cubed is 200 and something, um, but seven squared is 49, so that just seems a bit easier for now. So seven squared equals 49. Okay, and that's pretty much equal to 50. So now we're working with 50 cubed, which is, um, let's think about this, 5 cubed times 10 cubed. Okay, so that's equal to 125 times 1,000 to 125,000. Very good. All right. Um, so let's do another maths question. Um, so I'll be... I'll just share my screen again. Um, okay. So I want you to work out this interval. Okay. See the interval? Yeah. Okay. I'll just make a note of it. To x of one over square root one minus x squared dx. Okay. Yeah. Got that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, um, well, I don't know how to do this, like straight, I don't know this is a standard integral. So I guess I'd think about simplifying the denominator. Okay, well, so. Simplifying the denominator um, will probably make this harder than it is. Um, so maybe try a substitution. Okay. Um, uh, okay, I think, I, yeah, I can see what you mean. X, one minus x squared. Um, if we put x equals to um, sine theta. Yeah. Then we're going to have, um, okay, maybe cos theta. I'll stick with sine theta. And then we're going to have one minus sine squared theta equals cos squared theta. Um, so that would change the denominator. Um, but then we have to think about how dx changes or how the differential changes. So dx by d theta equals cos theta. Um, so now the integral change goes from one over the square root of cos squared theta, which is just cos theta, times by this 
dx d theta d theta, so just cos theta d theta. Um, and now the limits, so when x equals zero, then that's just theta equals zero, that's easy. Um, when x equals x, uh, then, well, x equals sine theta. So I just write sine theta. Yeah. Um, Is that right? Actually, when x equals oh, okay. yeah. 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 Okay. So x equals x, theta equals theta. Um, yeah. Sure. Okay, well, that's an easy interval. It's just zero to theta of d theta. Yeah. Um, which, um, well, that's just theta. So using the initial substitution up here, um, then theta would just be the inverse sine of x or arc sine x. So theta equals arc sine of x. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that means the integral which is equal to theta is equal to arc sine x. Yeah. Cool. Is that the right idea? Yeah, that was good. Um, so for the next question, I want you to work out the center of mass of a hemisphere of radius r and a constant density. Okay. Um, well, let me draw that to start with. Um, well, okay, so I know the form, the general formula for center of mass, which is the sum over um, the sum over the small component masses times their center of masses equals the total mass times the center of mass position. Yeah. Um, okay, and so I'm going to define this as Z. And then actually, if I put if I put this the origin, then you can see just by the symmetry that the center of mass in the x y plane will lie um, on the z axis. Yeah. Um, so I only really need to worry about the z coordinate. Um, okay. So I need to split up the hemisphere into smaller masses for this to work. Um, and I think, okay, I think an easy way to do that would be to um, split it up into small disks. Yeah. So let's say the, the disk is at the height of Z. And um, well, actually that's useful, I drew that line because that's a radius there. And then the radius of the disk is gonna be little r. Then we can straight away see from Pythagoras that r squared or little r squared is gonna be big r squared minus z squared. Um, so the mass of this small disk, that's gonna be the area pi r squared times its depth or width, um, which we can call that, um, well, let's take the limit that these get really, really thin. So we can call that dz. Um, so that will now be the volume of this disk times by the density, which we can assume the density is constant, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's just a constant. So that's going to be equal to my little m. Um, and let's call that little m of z. So, um, so just looking at the left hand side of this formula, um, we've, we're taking the limit that these small masses go to a zero. So that's going to turn the sum into an integral. So we're going to integrate from, well, z goes from zero to big R of pi times rho. And now this little R squared, we've worked out what that is in terms of big R and uh, z. 
R squared minus Z squared. Oh, and I've forgotten in this, oh no, um, so this XI here in the formula, that's going to be replaced by Z. Because like I said, we're just focusing on the Z center of mass coordinate, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, and then the right hand side, well, the big, the total mass is uh, easy because that's, we know the volume of a hemisphere, that's two pi over three r cubed rho. Mm -hmm. And then let's just call that a ZCM. And then DZ. Yeah, so, very good. That's good enough. Yeah, so then you work out the interval and you rearrange to get uh, the, um, basically your Z, a ZCM. Yeah, sure. that's good. So what if the, density was varying linearly um, from let's say two to one then what would what, what would you change in your uh, integral or like the overall thing um, so so you're saying the density is two at the bottom of the hemisphere and one at the top yeah okay so if it's changing linearly then should be able to write the density as a function of z. Well, mm -hmm. it's gonna, um, so as any, it's gonna start at two at z equals zero, and then yep. minus z, um, but at um, z equals r, then we want it to one, so it's gonna have to be z over r. Yeah, very good. So, yeah, so then we put this into here, but you also have to think about putting it into here. And instead of just writing this big M simply like that, we'd have to do an integral instead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, all right, that's good. Yeah, very good. Um, so let's move on uh, to a thermodynamics question that also involves mechanics. Um, so let me just share that problem. So we have this thermodynamic um, system that it, uh, it's at initial state P1, V1, and has uh, an amount of uh, substance M, or the mass, but that's constant throughout the process. So the initial state is P1, V1, and so the pressure and volume are P1 and V1. So let's look at the final state. Um, which is basically um, if we extract heat from this um, initial state, we get the final state. Yeah. So, yeah. do you think P2 is less than or is it bigger than P1? So, we extract heat from this system, uh, from the initial system to get to the final system. Yeah. And this yeah. Uh, piston is connected to that. Um, pulley, which the pulley is connected to a rod, and the rod is connected to a mass, and they're all all act as a um, single rigid body. Yeah, so they're all connected together. Um, sure. So, do you think P two is going to be less than or bigger than P one? Um, uh, okay, so. Looking at the final case, well, um, when the mass on the pulley is at an angle theta, then because of its weight, um, there'll be some torque. Um, yeah. So that means the rope connecting the pulley to the piston will be under tension in that case. And so be pulling to the right. And so that means the pressure on the outside would have to be greater than in the cylinder to equalize that form. So P2 should be less. Yeah, good. Right. Good. Um, so just to clarify this, um, P1 is uh, the absolute pressure of the system, and P2 is the absolute pressure of the system in the final state. Yeah? So um, there are not relative pressures. Okay. Um, okay. So let's try to relate P, P1 and P2 
to the position of the mass m, which is basically determined by theta. Yeah, so let's try and um, balance those out. Okay. So I'm going to share the screen. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I've got, I can see, I remember what that looks like now. Um, all right. So, well, at the, uh, I'll just draw the first, the initial state to start with. Um, okay, so, well, okay, so this is, so we can see that the weight of the mass is acting directly downwards. Um, and so there's not gonna be any torque generated on this pulley. So that means that if there's no torque on the pulley because of this mass, um, then to be in equilibrium, there can't be any torque due to the rope or due to the, this cable. Yeah. Um, so, so that would mean that the, um, so what would that mean? No force in the cable. So, okay, the pressure in the cylinder, so P1 and the pressure outside the cylinder will be the same. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess that's when theta is zero, then we've got equal pressure and then it's just in the equilibrium initial state. Yeah. So now let's, so let's think about um, when it is at an angle theta. So I'll just rub this out. Um, okay, now it's just a general P. So, um, right, let's think about the weight of this. So, um, I'm gonna have to think about the component of the weight which contributes the torque. So actually, if I draw this angle theta there. So now, um, well, so let's just call the length of that rod L then the torque due to this smaller weight or the, the weight will be mg sine theta times by, um, so mg sine theta is the perpendicular component of the force to this rod times by L. So that's the torque due to the mass pulley, masses weight on the pulley. So for this to be, are we saying we're, this is gonna be in an equilibrium state? Yeah, so we extract heat uh, at a very slow rate so that uh, it reaches equilibrium um, infinitesimally. So like you, we extract some heat, we let it, um, to reach we let it reach equilibrium and then we extract more. And we never, so we, we don't need to involve acceleration in this problem, basically. Okay. Okay, so then, okay, so that, if this is in like a, a instantaneous e equilibrium kind of thing, then, so this, let's say the tension in the cable here, let's call it big F, and which, oh, it's actually going to be acting the, the other way. Yeah, it's going to be acting the other way because the, the torque due to the weight is gonna be acting clockwise. So the tension um, torque, which actually goes on top of the pulley. So I've misdrawn that. Yeah. So that's gonna to have to act counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. So it must be going this way. So um, let's say the pulley has radius big R. Um, then we can write the torque due to the tension as what well, I call it, I just call it tau one equals F times big R. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, okay, now, so yeah, we're in the equilibrium, so we're gonna have to balance the torques. Um, so we've got mg sine theta times L equals big F times R. Yeah, and you had uh, an equation for F uh, in the previous page, so. Okay, um, 
oh yeah and to do with the pressure differences so f would be equal to p naught minus p so uh times a yeah Uh, yeah, that's good. Well, that's right. Okay, so combining that, we've got mg sine theta times L equals P naught minus P times A. Yeah, which you can, I mean, of course, you can write P naught uh, minus P1 as uh, a relative pressure rather than the absolute pressure. And then you can get rid of um, basically that uh, p p naught minus p. But uh, okay, so that's good. You wrote, wrote the force balance for this problem. So how would you work out the work done um, by the uh, basically the piston uh, if, if the mass moves from theta equals zero to a certain value of theta? Okay. Well, when um, the mass moves around theta, then that's going to mean the cable length or the, okay, so the distance from the pulley to the piston is going to get bigger. Yeah. Um, so that means there's going to be a change in volume um, in the gas. And we know that a change in volume um, is equal to the work or that causes um, work done by the gas or, or on the gas by the surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. So we write that as the work done by the environment on the gas will be equal to minus something like that. Yeah, that's good. So delta P by that you mean the pressure difference between inside and outside the um yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um so um mm -hmm. do you think so if uh, do you think the work done um would equal the um, heat extraction. So uh, do you think the two values would be the same? So the work done by the piston on this problem, would that equal to the heat extracted from the, um, the, sys the thermodynamic system, or would it be less or more than that? Okay, well, so I guess, that would come down to whether energy is conserved. Yeah, energy so, is yeah, energy is conserved in this problem, and there is no friction in the piston. Okay, then so then since there's no friction in the piston or the pulley, then there'll be no heat loss there. So yeah, I would think that the heat extracted from the gas should equal the work done on the pulley. I think that's correct. So what about the air inside or whatever the um, substances inside that piston? As you cool it down, um, don't you think the internal energy of the gas would reduce? Oh, oh okay. So we're extracting heat out um but also a less energy is stored in the gas mm -hmm. so that so that would mean the work done is um maybe great uh less than the work done less well, than the heat yeah the work done is actually less well we're talking in terms of magnitudes not positive or negative values so yeah so yeah. If you extract um, you need to extract more heat than uh, the amount of work you can get because 
uh, some of the heat that you'll be extracting is going to be uh, reducing the internal energy of the system. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And yeah, can you think of any other way of writing uh, the work done uh, apart from the thermodynamic way, which is delta p uh, v uh, dv? Um, so, can you think of any other way of writing that down? So. Um, well, okay, so the mass, yeah, so the mass is moving around the pulley, and so that means it's getting higher, and so the mass will increase gravitational potential energy. Yeah. So let's write, oh, the change in, um, the change in energy would be, well, mg, what's the height going to be? Um, L minus L cos eta. Yeah, very good. Okay, that's good. And so how would you define equilibrium in terms of, in terms of energy? Equilibrium in terms of energy. Um, so how do you relate well, the two things? Yeah, go on. So when the work done equals the change in gravitational potential energy. Yeah, um, well, think about minimum, like, um, yeah, the minimum energy. Um, mm -hmm. Would that correspond to the equilibrium position? Oh, so when eta equals zero, um, that's the, so then we'll have mgl minus l, which would be zero. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So equilibrium is, um, we have stable and unstable equilibrium. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So stable equilibrium is where energy is minimum and unstable equilibrium is when energy is maximum but it's still um so basically the first derivative of energy um uh, is zero but um the second derivative of energy um is uh pos yeah positive yeah um so try to differentiate that um, delta E with respect to theta and find the equilibrium positions with respect to theta. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll just call it E, maybe make it a bit easier to differentiate or the notation. Yeah. So, so you're saying, okay, so DE by D theta is going to be equal to mg. Well, L is just a constant, um, so that's not going to, well, that would differentiate to zero. And then we've got minus L, cos theta differentiates to minus sine, so plus. Okay. So the energy, so the equilibrium will be the stationary points in energy. Is that correct? So yeah. when this equals zero. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, so um we're gonna say it's at, in equilibrium when d by d theta equals zero. Um so the only thing that's changing here is the sine theta. Mm -hmm. So we've got sine theta equals zero. Um so well there's two like distinct solutions to that here. We've got theta equals zero and theta equals pi. Um, which, yeah, that, that makes sense when it's directly down. Um, so we've got directly down here or directly up here. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. can you differentiate that uh, d, e, d theta again? Um, yeah, I mean, yes. I assume you can. Um, so, and basically determine which one is a stable equilibrium and which one is an unstable equilibrium. Okay. Um, 
so the second derivative, well, that's just proportional to sine theta here. So that's going to be proportional to cos theta. Mm -hmm. um, cos of zero is one. Uh, oh, a bit better. Cos of zero equals one. Yeah. And cos of pi equals minus minus yeah. one. Okay. And so what would that tell you in terms of the um, stability? So, well, um, cos of zero is one is positive, so that would equate to an energy minima. And yeah. cos of pi is negative, so that would equate to an energy maximum. Yeah, so and energy maxima would be unstable. Yeah, and that would that does make sense if you look at the problem. If if you need a very precise uh, calibration to basically maintain that um, pendulum or mass at uh, uh, theta equal to pi. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Very good. Um, so that's uh, the end of our interview. And okay. I hope you have a good day. You too. Thank you. No problem. Goodbye. Bye.